everybody. I'm so excited about today's show. I'm telling you, God is going to change your life. This show is so special to me because I'm with one of my favorite people in all the world. Heidi Baker is with us today. Heidi has been used to really touch my heart and my life in an incredible way. I have my brother here with me, Theo Culianos, who pastors a church here in Orlando, Florida, and of course the legendary Dan Daniel <laughs> Colenda, one of my best friends in the whole world, and somebody you may have heard of, Heidi, is here with us. And we're going to talk about Jesus today. We're going to talk about loving him. We're going to talk about how to love him, how to fall more deeply in love with him, how to experience his presence. And then out of that overflowing love, how to become the gospel to the nations of the world. And I don't know many people who model that better than you, Heidi. So thanks so much for Aww. being with us. We're Thank really you. honored to have you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Heidi, let's talk about, uh, I want to go back to the beginning, um, back to that encounter. I know it's not the very beginning but you've spoken often about that encounter in Toronto. So many lives were changed in Toronto. Kind of lead us up to Toronto, what happened there, and uh, what you came away with. Okay. I was absolutely undone by God when I met Jesus at 16, and then filled with Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit just completely crashed in on me, and I never heard of anything about Holy Spirit, nothing, I've never seen or heard anything, and I, I walked into a Pentecostal Holiness Church at 16, wow. and they, they, they knew I was not initiated because I was wearing trousers, and <laughs> I had makeup on, and so they totally stared at me and preached just at me because they thought I was a heathen, but I'd right. actually been saved for a day, so <laughs> I just wasn't initiated. So I didn't know. Saint. I didn't know how to, <laughs> you know, right. what to wear. And um, there were about thirty people there, and God just crashed in wow. seriously on me. And I was kneeling down, and and everything turned pitch black, and then this bright white light came, and I started praying in tongues, and wow. and just fluently praying in tongues and crying out to God and I was so completely undone and five months later uh, they taught me they taught me this whole time how to fast and pray five months later I was in the glory in this tiny little church in central Mississippi and I was in the glory and I just had my hands lifted up and I was worshiping him and and I stopped hearing the preachers wow. and in even if the church has 30 people in it, if they're loud Pentecostal preachers, like, you can hear them. They're screaming yeah. out. And um, I could hear nothing wow. but him. And I heard the audible voice of God. And Jesus kissed my left hand. And he said, you're to be married to me. Oil ran down my arm. And he called me to be a minister and a missionary to go to Africa, Asia, and England. And I was completely wrecked. I, I never, I've never been the same since that day. The next day, I started preaching the gospel, the age of 16, on the streets. In Mississippi? Uh, in Mississippi, and I lived on an Indian reservation as an American field service student. I'm from Laguna Beach, yeah, so it was like another world. Yeah, American field service. Oh. And God, a Choctaw reservation, a Navajo preacher led me to Jesus. Pentecostal holiness taught me about holiness, about fasting, about prayer, about holy devotion yes. to Jesus, about yes. a passion for Jesus. And so I started preaching and I never stopped, but I got tired. I got exhausted. I just kept, I'm so easily um, given to sacrifice. That's not difficult, you know, like live among the poor, give away everything you own. That yeah. stuff is easy for me. But rest um, is more of a challenge, like rest, actually resting in his presence, resting in his glory. So when I went to Toronto, uh, we already had 320 children in our full-time care. I had about four people on our staff. I was so tired. I was so burned out. I said, I love you, Jesus, but I hate missions. I just hate <laughs> missions. And I, I mean, I had 
an earned PhD, yeah. and I thought to myself, I don't want to go teach in seminary because I don't want to mess anyone up. <laughs> I mean, I'm so tired, and I so don't think I know anything that I just want to work at Kmart. And that's what was in my mind. Working at Kmart. I want to work at Kmart and just do blue light, <laughs> blue light. That was what I wanted to do. I was done yeah. with missions. And I love Jesus forever, but missions was so overrated in my mind. Mm -hmm. Like, thir 320 kids, they want shoes, they want food every single day. <laughs> we, we were so poor. We were poorer than the poor. And we ate pineapple from dented cans that didn't have labels on them. Most of the cans we bought were dented cans with pineapple. So I was sick of pineapple. I was sick of being shot at. I was sick of machine guns firing outside my night, every night outside my window. I was just tired. And my husband had gone to Toronto. And the reason that I thought I would go is because he came back nice. <laughs> Like, he was this fourth generation, hardline, you know, kind of missionary. Right. And he wasn't always that nice, you know. Sometimes he was grouchy. Mm. Well, that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> he was grouchy a lot. But <laughs> he just came back from Toronto so sweet. Like, really sweet, really gentle, really full. And, you know, just came back. Here's some perfume. I'm like, what? He never get, gave me presents or anything. That wasn't the point, but it, yes, kind of. Yeah, you know, sure. you came back sweet. Absolutely. And so I was really sick with double pneumonia, and I was in South Africa, and they, you know, I was dying yet again. I was just sick and tired. And I said, I want to go to Toronto. Roland came back sweet. I might as well go there. It's either Toronto or Kmart. Maybe it's Toronto and then Kmart. Right. So I went, and I remember I had to fly an Egypt Air, which mm. is the cheapest airline in the world for us back then. They were smoking. Wow. And I had oh, double wow. pneumonia. So I'm like <gasps> trying to breathe and just dying. And I walked in the door, and I was super frustrated. I was so frustrated. I was immediately offended because they said, you can't smoke. And I'm thinking, I'm Pentecostal, you know. I don't smoke, I'm not a drunkard, I don't, you know. Yeah. I'm thinking, don't you know who I am? I'm this missionary, I gave my life for love and don't smoke, but I smelled like smoke. So they immediately upset me and I had to get past that. Hmm. And then the people that were preaching you know, they were wearing matching clothes, which I thought was kind of odd, like moo moo, pink, purple, and the guy wore pink and purple shirt. And I thought, oh man. Like, oh, it's a long flight Jesus, to see this. I'm tired. They're wearing matching moo moo <laughs> outfits, and they think I'm a smoker. And so all of this is, you know, sometimes it happens with people, they can't get past the external stuff, yeah. and so they can't move into the presence. They're offended by something, so they can't get to where God wants them to go. Shakaraba, he wants us to go past the offense and into the presence. So he literally let that happen to me to see where my heart would go. And so these guys were, were talking about healing and they said Jesus is healing some missionary with double pneumonia and I'm looking around must be someone else they're gonna push me over right, right. I don't want to be pushed over I feel so tired and sick they're gonna push me over and they said it's a woman she has double pneumonia she's being healed right now so I thought okay okay God and I take this deep breath and I was completely, utterly, totally healed. Wow. So they said, come on up here. And I'm, I'm so excited that I'm healed that I thought, never mind, even if they push me over, I'm good. I'm going to go. <laughs> so I run up there, and they asked me to say what just happened. And I mean, I just fell out in the spirit. Whoa. And this is when I had the vision that changed my life. Talk and about that. It was 17 years ago, and it's, my life's never been the same because 
I saw this sea of children. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands. They, well, they never ended. Maybe there were millions. There were different colors of children. There were Asians and Africans and Caucasians and South Americans, just children everywhere. And I was started screaming, no, because I knew he was calling me to feed them. And I, di I didn't want to, I just didn't want to even think about it. But then I saw Jesus. When you see him, everything changes because yeah. his eyes, they burn like yeah. fire. They are so full of love. They're so full of passion. They're so full of presence. And he just looked at me and he said, I died that there would always be enough. And then he takes his hand and he pulls a piece of flesh out of his side, his right side, and he pulls it out and he hands it to me like this. This is a piece of flesh in my hands. And he says, give it to the children, feed it to the children. And my first thought was, that is an ugly piece of flesh. How am I gonna feed that to the children? But I, I just, I was so undone by his eyes that I couldn't deny what he'd asked me to do. And so I just started reaching my hand out like that and the flesh just turned into bread. Fresh bread in my hands, S fresh bread. It looked like Mozambican bread. It was fresh, it was warm in my hands. And I just started reaching it out and just reaching it out and reaching it out. And, and it just multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And it went on for hours. And then he looked at me again. And this time he took his same hand and he put it by his side. And he had a poor man's cup. It wasn't jeweled. It wasn't elegant. It was the kind of cup that I use about three days a week in Mozambique. It's a half of a gourd. It's a, it's a curb. You could be a half a coconut shell, a gourd. It's a very poor man's cup. And he put it next to his side and blood and water flowed out. Holy! And he looked at me and without speaking, he spoke without moving his lips. He said, it's a cup of suffering and joy. Will you drink it? And I knew, I knew I had to drink that cup. I knew I, I wouldn't do anything but drink of that cup. And, and I, I was thinking about what that would mean. And then I just let that go. And I just started drinking this cup of suffering and joy. And as I'm drinking of it, I'm so transformed and I'm so undone by his eyes. And he said, give it to the children without moving his lips. He spoke to me, holy heart to heart, just heart to heart, like spirit to spirit. And I reach this cup out and I'm thinking, how can I give a cup of suffering and joy to the children? Like, it's a mixed cup. It's not one or the other. It's both and more. Mm -hmm. And I was so touched by the love in his eyes that I just reached it out. And then this cup of blood and water became drink. And the children drank and I drank and we drank and drank and drank and drank and drank. And it went on and on and on for hours and hours. And he said, I died that there would always be enough. And since that day, I've never feared how we're gonna get food, where he calls me to go, whether he calls me to just sit in the dirt or preach in a stadium, it doesn't matter. I just wanna feed people Jesus. I just want the fresh bread. I wanna eat Jesus. I wanna drink Jesus. I wanna be sustained by Jesus. I wanna live with Jesus. I want him to be my all in all. And I want people to stop eating junk food, to stop eating that cotton candy and diet Coke Christianity that's just like so 
causes so much malnourishment that people are just sick. And I want people to eat what's real. Jesus says in John 6, I am the bread of life. No man can eat anything but Jesus and live. We have to drink Jesus and eat Jesus. So that's what changed my life. I've never been the same. And I've never wanted to work at Kmart again. (laughs) (laughs) Ever. Hi, I, I, I want to ask you a question because you, you ministered last night at a, uh, at a conference here in town and um, I saw some people tweeting about it and one of the comments I thought was very appropriate is that somebody said the thing that impressed them the most about your ministry was the love that they could sense and the love that they could feel. And I know that you portray that love to people when you minister to them, but that always seems to come from a revelation of how God, how, how Christ feels about us. Mm. And, and that must, as a, as, an, as a missionary, as an evangelist, that must play into your theology mm. and your definition of the gospel. Can you tell me what is the gospel to you? And specifically, what is the gospel with relation to the love of Christ? To love the Lord your God with all your heart mm. and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself to be compelled by His love, and to be so undone in the love of the Father that your identity changes, that you never feel like an orphan again, that you don't have a need to be needed, that you're just so full of Him that every person that you see every day, you're present with them. You're present with the one that God puts in front of you because he somehow graced you with the moment to be in the presence of someone, whether they're a man eaten away by worms in the dirt or a lady with leprosy or a king in a palace. Every single human being is created in the image of God, created for dignity, created for the Father's love, created for kindness, created for mercy. And so everything about my life is longing to live the simplicity of the gospel, which is just to stay in love with Daddy, stay in love with Jesus, and be present with the one he puts in front of me, and to carry the love of God. And after all those years of studying, all those years of systematic theology, I've been reduced to this. And I I like to wait. I'm a waiter. I, I like to wait. I'm generally late for everything. But that's because I, I like to be present when I'm there. I like to see the one in front of me. Hey, a lot of times we can't really experience love because we don't know how God sees us. But once we know how he sees us, then we are to see others in the same way. And how does he see us? He sees us as his children. He sees us as his beloved. And he sees the orphans that don't know Jesus yet. He sees them as orphans and he has this radical compassion on them. He sees the lost as orphans in rags and in in starvation mode and his heart is burning for them. I know because I have a heart for orphans. I call them home to the Father all the time and and they're not just the orphans, the physical orphans that we call home in Africa. They're, They're orphans, spiritual orphans all over the world. And for me, the the gospel looks like love manifest in the restroom with the lady washing the sink. If you're carrying the love of God, then it has to be the same with her as it is at some table with dignitaries. If it looks any different to to the guy that's doing security, then, then somehow it's not the gospel because good news has to look like love everywhere. It has to be real everywhere. It has to be manifest everywhere in the one that you're married to and the kids. It's like, and so I always go into daddy and say, God, give me more love, daddy, because I want to carry radical love every moment of my life. And it all comes from him. 
Hey, it's a gift. Yeah. It's a gift. <laughs> you know, I can sense the presence of the Lord to even talk right now. It's pretty difficult. But um, the moment that I, I set eyes on you in the green room, I could see the love of Jesus all over you. Um, it's something that, that, that I think... I think there's a lot of uh, people who are just searching for love. Um, it's amazing how you didn't exchange a word, but I sense the love of God. How does Heidi, you said stay in love, how does Heidi stay in love with Jesus? Well, I receive love every day. I receive love in the presence. And I, I don't, this may be a little different from some people, but I don't ask him for, for the, so many things. Like, I don't have a big list. I'm like a little kid that just, like, hugs, Daddy, <laughs> hugs, Jesus. I just live like that. I wake up and I say, welcome, Holy Spirit. And, and I just am with the presence of God. I'm with my daddy. I'm with my Jesus. And I just receive from him. And then when I'm with people, I actually see Jesus in them. I actually see that person created in the image of God. And, and so I feel love for them and love for him at the same time, so I'm not compartmentalizing. It's not like, this is my little devotion time, this is my little ministry time, this is my little session where I'm gonna do this. No, it's my whole life. He's my everything. He's my breath and my life and my passion. And I want to be present. I want to be present to carry the fragrance of Christ Wherever I go, I want the maid in the room when I'm traveling to feel that. I want the beggar on the street when I'm at home to feel that. I want my husband to feel that love of Jesus. And I don't, I don't know anything else, and that's my five-year plan and my 10-year plan. And, yeah, we're building a university that rocks. You know, we're opening a hospital. That's exciting. But none of it matters to me unless the love of God is manifest to the people that are present with us. Well, Heidi, I, I think uh, some people, I, I can say this because I was one of them, there's this tendency to believe that maybe loving Jesus just isn't enough. It's not, it's, uh, especially in the ministry world, it's not the crescendo ministry achievement. And it's almost this thought that, you know, uh, what about miracles and what about the masses and what about raising the dead? I mean, we have to fulfill the Great Commission too. First of all, I mean, it's not an either or issue, like you said. I mean, how many deaf ears would you say you guys have seen as a team? I, I can't even count. And thousands many, and thousands and thousands. How many have been raised, raised from the dead? Hundreds. In our movement, yeah. hundreds. We, we stopped counting. Yeah. And it's not just you. No. Oh, me? No. I've only seen one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the ears, no, I've seen, I've right. seen thousands of people right. heal, healed with, um, from deafness. But, so, yeah, but the dead, i only seen one myself, but hundreds in our movement. When did you see that, that first dead person? Right? Um, I was in Zimpetu, Mozambique, in mm -hmm. the south, and one of our pastors died. And I don't even know if it counts, because there were hundreds of pastors there. We're all just screaming out <laughs> to God. And uh, he got up. Funny thing was, he wasn't right with God, so he didn't want to want to close his eyes. He was terrified. Wow. But um, he got set free, and he was raised from the dead. and. I have prayed for a couple, one on a phone that got up. That was cool in Philippines. Yeah, a little crazy. girl, yeah. She was dead and she was raised back up. So Heidi, I guess my question would be, um, does everything flow from that intimacy with Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. John 15. Um, 
we can do nothing without him. Yeah. It's being connected to Jesus. Everything flows out of intimacy, all fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. when, it, when he says nothing, he means nothing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us in ministry, we start spinning our wheels. You know, it's about numbers and I never worry about numbers. I, we're not trying to be a church growth movement or even a mission movement. We're trying to be so in, so just present with God and present with our neighbor that they actually feel love and God feels our love to him and we receive his love. And then all the rest of it just happens. The thousands of churches and, the, you know, tens of thousands yeah. of people coming to Jesus. It all flows out of that place of intimacy. To some people would say it can't be that simple. And you're saying it, it is. That's what happened to me. You know, I remember praying for the sick and no one was getting healed for years. And then finally Jesus started coming in and stuff just started happening. Isn't it easier? It's way easier. <laughs> <laughs> I knew every prayer. I knew the song. I thought I knew every confession of healing faith. And I mean, I think we had like a miracle or two a year. And then the Lord started coming. And I remember asking the Lord, is it really this easy? Yes. Is it that simple? And you used the word simplicity earlier uh, in, in the interview. Take us, if you would, as the Lord would allow you. What is available? You mentioned intimacy and that, that time alone with the Lord. What is available to that person who wants to seek the Lord? I mean, what kind of stuff has God revealed to you from an experience perspective? that you're allowed to talk about? I yeah. mean, is there really <laughs> wonder and heaven available for that person who will choose to spend time with the Lord? He's, he's calling us all to marry Him. To receive daily teaching from Michael Koulianos and to follow his ministry schedule around the world, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. By partnering with Jesus Image, you will help us take the life-saving gospel around the world through international miracle services, conferences, and television. Your giving will change lives for eternity. For more information, call 407-878-7421 or write us at Jesus Image, P.O. Box 950-640, Lake Mary, Florida, 32795. Again, thank you for your prayers and financial support. God bless you. The proceeding was paid for by the friends and partners of Jesus Image.